Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Andrew Sun, the president of Heritage University, and I'm very happy to welcome you to our Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis, the legacy and threshold of change event at Heritage University. I am sorry that I could not be there with you live, but I do believe in the importance of this event, and I wanted to make sure that I could give you a welcome. We are living in difficult times, and it's important to remember uh, the good things that have happened in our nation, and also to think about how we're gonna work towards a better future. That's why I believe that the legacy of these two individuals is so important, and I know that you will benefit from the uh, words that you will hear today. I like to say that for me, my favorite quote from Martin Luther King Jr. is the, the one that states the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. To me, that means that we have hard work ahead of us, but we are going in the right direction for a better world for all of us. Sometimes we take the wrong path for a while, but we work towards getting back on the right direction. And I believe that education is crucial to improving our world. That's why we are all at Heritage University. That's why those of you that are faculty are faculty. That's why those of you that are students are students is because we believe in the power of education. So I like to close with another quote, which is really not from Martin Luther King or John Lewis, but from another great leader in our world, not the United States, but that is Nelson Mandela. And I always love when Nelson Mandela said the following, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Take that to heart, everybody. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Think about a better 2021 for all of us, a better life for all of us, and please enjoy the program today. All right, I think next up is a says. A lot of you may know me, some of you might not. Um, my name is Isaias Guerrero. I am a, an alumni of Heritage, but I also, um, today's actually my first day as the Student Life Director. So I'm um, going straight in. Um, so welcome to all of you who are here. Welcome to the students. Um, I'm so excited that you are all here joining us today and remembering uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, one of my favorite quotes I would have to say is, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Um, hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Um, as a Christian myself, I, I really um, am drawn to these words and um, I encourage you all to, to continue to, to be the light and be the um, be that love in this world that we need to see. Um, the world, the news is so so scary to turn on nowadays. Um, and for me, what I do when I when I turn on the news, it just it freaks me out. And so I turn to prayer. That's kind of how I cope. Um, and so with all with your permission, um, I would like to take a moment of um, just a short prayer. Um, if you don't pray, if you want to take this as a moment of silence, feel free to do that. Um, but I'm just going to ask God to to show us how to how to love each other a little bit more. All right, um, if you can close your eyes. Father God, thank you for, for allowing us to be here today to remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all the amazing things that he's done um, in activism and in showing love to your people and um, to this country. I pray that all of us here at Heritage University can learn to love each other a little bit more, that can learn to embrace each other and embrace our differences. Thank you for, for your goodness and your unfailing love. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So with that, I'll pass it on to the next person. All right. Um, I guess that would be me. Um, it's not switching to, to speaker view. Um, but uh, I'm Paul Landry. Uh, associate professor in the College of Education. Uh, and uh, I want to say uh, good day to all of you. Um, and you know, if I may say, it's, it's a better day than many days that I have seen, especially over the past four years. Uh, and so 
uh, of welcoming you to this forum, which I hope will be productive. Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis, Legacy and Threshold of Change. In formulating this program, and, and I want to first express my appreciation, or if I'm allowed in my vernacular, to give a shout out to the team that assembled and, and developed this event, and uh, especially Mary James, Dr. Mel Hill, Gloria Jones Dance, Isaias Guerrero, Daniel Eisman, Davison Mance, and Jim Dugan. Uh, thank you all. It, it really could not have come together without the cooperation and thoughts of all. But in formulating this program, we felt it important that it be more than just a quote unquote remembrance of Dr. King who was brutally taken from us on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis in 1968, before many who were here were, were born. And Congressman John Robert Lewis, who just recently passed. We of course would do well to remember their lives and their heroic actions, for it is from the vantage point of standing on their shoulders that we can envision many of the rights and opportunities that we enjoy today. But from that present outlook, we may also see how in danger those rights and values can be when they are taken for granted. To truly honor the lives and the contributions, their legacy, we felt it important to focus upon the threshold where we stand today, to look to the future and to try to respond to the challenge uh, that they gave us. What can, what must we do now? How can we ensure that the struggle and the sacrifices of the past, the pain, hardship, and fear for their very lives that they had to endure, that the fruit of those sacrifices and the changes wrought will be carried into the future, in our lives and into the lives of those who come after us. That is our challenge. We will share with you brief profiles of some courageous activists who more recently have charted paths towards change and toward a brighter future, even if at substantial personal cost. For change does not come easy and does not come cheap. And so we will highlight Colin Kaepernick, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Stacey Abrams. But before uh, we do so, um, I had changed my background, which is what I said. Before we do so, I wanted to, it, we want to introduce John Lewis to you. Uh, you can see behind me a photograph that I took in March of 2015, shortly before I came to Heritage University. It was taken standing in the crowd uh, at the 50th anniversary of the commemoration of the Selma to Montgomery March, staring uh, as we crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. Literally thousands gathered to walk in the footsteps of John Lewis, inspired by the efforts of Rosa Parks and others, and who Dr. King referred to as that boy from Troy. Along with other brave souls, he marched across that bridge to face the brutality of the Alabama state troopers, intent upon denying them their right to vote and their humanity. So we felt it important that you get acquainted with John Lewis through a brief excerpt from a movie, which I recommend to all of you, which is called Good Trouble. Well, I hope that that uh, provided you with a bit of a um, tease for the uh, the movie, you should get it. And there are all sorts of tidbits. For example, 
if you sort of know the history, as he was sitting at his dining room table, if you looked up over his right shoulder, there was a painting on the wall of uh, someone feeding the chickens in the chicken yard. Well, that might just be a pastoral setting, but his parents who were sharecroppers were given land, which the family owned until his death where they raised chickens and he would go out and feed the chickens and his sister said, preach to the chickens. Uh, and so there's just these nuances uh, that, that come out. So it, it is, I do recommend it to you. Maybe we can get a copy in the library and people can, uh, can enjoy that. There's a lot of good stuff in the movie and, and for you to both enjoy and to think about. And the story of John Lewis reminds us that we all, each one of us comes from somewhere. And we're given time and presented with opportunities and challenges. We make choices about those circumstances we're faced with and those choices that we make, if we choose to contribute to act for the good of others, rather than simply to take, can make a difference. Now, I don't profess to know what it is that sparks us to activism. Maybe it's only certain individuals. I don't believe that. Uh, or maybe it's being in the right place at the right time. And that would seem to be a little bit too much chance. But I don't know what it is that leads to effective activism. Or maybe it is a constant drumbeat within us that builds and strengthens into a cadence and into a rhythm until at some point we are compelled to respond with action. As I say, I don't really know. But I do think it is important for each one of us to ask ourselves about the potential opportunities that we are faced with to make a better world, ones that we encounter and the choices that we make. Now, I sometimes wonder myself, was it the mistreatment that my older brother received at the hands of a white lieutenant while serving in Vietnam? Or was it because of the books that I was reading uh, in college that sparked me to take a personal journey across the country towards Washington, DC to protest against that Southeast Asian conflict. Well, along the way, as happenstance occurs, I witnessed firsthand the aftermath of the massacre at Kent State. Students, not unlike myself, the blood on the concrete. I had a choice. I could turn back and go home. But something caused me at that point to journey on to Washington, D.C., to join a large crowd in Washington, D.C., to march against the Vietnam War. Choices, actions. And it is said that that march was a precipitating factor that led to the end of the war. So I won't bore you with any more details of my adventures. Uh, as I tell my students, I'm only 4,000 years old, so I've, I've been at this for a while. But I do want, I'd like to share with you the profiles of some current activists who made the choice to act when presented with opportunities and are making a real difference. Uh, and I'd like to start with Colin Kaepernick, so I'll turn it over to Davidson. Well, thank you very much. And I am truly honored to join you all today to talk about Colin Kaepernick. Colin Kaepernick, born November 3rd, 1987, is an American civil rights activist and football quarterback who is a free agent. He played six seasons for the San Francisco 49ers, the National Football League. As a political activist, he knelt during the national anthem at the start of NFL games in protest of police brutality and racial inequality in the United States. 
He was adopted by a white family in Milwaukee, and the family moved to California, where he achieved statewide honors. He set records and was Pac Offensive Player of the Year while playing college for Nevada. He was drafted by the Cubs to play professional baseball, but chose to stay in and play football. San Francisco traded up to select him as the 39th pick in the NFL draft. He became a starter when Alex Smith got injured. He had risen as an NFL star that led his team to the Super Bowl and a conference championship game. The idea and connection to the theme is that he decided to take action to publicly voice his concerns about racial injustice and given his status, taking action involved real risk. He chose to do so in an environment that held little, if any, respect for the intelligence of athletes of color. His decision to take a knee followed a prior refusal to stand or participate in the national anthem in two prior games while injured. But when he returned from the bench and suited up, he chose to take a knee after consulting with a former NFL player and veteran player who is white, who supported his protest. The predictable response of the predominantly white and NFL ownership and much of the sports fan base was, shut up and play. His response was that, I cannot and will not salute and honor a symbol of a nation that refuses to acknowledge or live up to the values the flag is supposed to represent. This was in response to the long and growing list of young black men being killed by police and with apparent impunity. Many other players of colors and in other sports joined the symbolic protest to let the public know that the issue was serious and would not go away. No longer would the weekend game of sports be a convenient escape to ignore the social injustice lived daily on the streets of the nation in communities of color. Social, in many ways, Copernic's protests led to and morphed into the Black Lives Matter movement. And the cost was real. Upon becoming a free agent, no other NFL team would even interview Kaepernick for a starting quarterback position, even teams desperately in need of talent. He was locked out of his profession and career because he chose to take a stand as an activist for social justice. In 2018, Nike released an ad featuring Kaepernick with the text, believe in something even if it means sacrificing everything. NFL spokesperson Jocelyn Moore responded to the ad saying Kaepernick's social justice campaign deserves our attention and action. In June 2020, amid the George Floyd protests, the New York Times wrote that the NFL had wrestled with the issue of race, noting that three quarters of NFL players are African-American. Yet nearly every NFL team owner is white and several are prominent Trump supporters. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell put out a statement where he apologized for not listening to the concerns of African-American players. The Times wrote that Goodell's words were panned as hypocritical because of the league's owner's rejection of Kaepernick. Michael Rosenberg of Sports Illustrated wrote, mainstream white America is going to reconsider Kaepernick at some point, the way it reconsidered Muhammad Ali after years after he refused to go to Vietnam, the way it reconsidered Jackie Robinson and Jack Johnson. Progress comes in fits and starts, and this country tends to punish those who urge it to move faster. The reconsideration of Kaepernick has begun. And in August, after the shooting of Jacob Blake, a black man, Goodell said that he'd wished the NFL had listened earlier to Kaepernick's reasons for kneeling. As we recognize Colin Kaepernick for his activism during our MLK event today, just this week, USA Today's Mike Freeman wrote, if you don't think the threads between Kaepernick and King are real, well, you're wrong. While King is popular now, two thirds of Americans disapproved of King. Many hated his blunt words on race, policing, and des desegregation. The same is the case with some and Kaepernick, and it's not unthinkable to see a future where Kaepernick is revered as a civil rights hero. In fact, that transformation is already happening, and he's long been viewed this way by most Black people. 
Freeman goes on to write, it's also far more stretched to say that King would have approved of Copernic's tactics and methods. King called Jackie Robinson, who broke the color line in 1947, a pilgrim that walked in the lonesome byways toward the high road of freedom. He was a sit-inner before sit-ins, a freedom writer before freedom rides. Freeman ends his article by writing, Copernic has spent years speaking on police abuse. Like King, he was right. In fact, he may have been righter than we ever knew. Now let's turn things over to Melissa Hill. Thank you. Recognizing another activist today is Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, born to a working class Puerto Rican family in the Bronx, New York. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez graduated from Boston University, majoring in economics and international relations. During college, she worked for Senator Ted Kennedy's office, where she focused on immigration issues. After graduating, she returned home and became a community organizer. However, with the recession taking hold, along with the financial hardships her family faced after her father's death in 2008 from cancer, Ocasa Cortez took multiple low wage restaurant jobs to help keep the family afloat. This is where she learned of the inadequacies of low income jobs and how it affected working class families. In June 2008, Alexandra Ocasio Cortez, also known as AOC, upset her, rep her representative, excuse me, upset Representative jo Joseph Crowley in New York's 14th district which includes part of the Bronx and Queens. Her grassroots victory was an upright, created an uprising. Despite Callie's, Crowley's 10 to one fundraising advantage over AOC, the, she was able to outsmart and outorganize this grassroots campaign, campaign, along with powerful viral videos and ads. Many of them started with, women like me aren't supposed to run for office. AOC was the first opponent in the Democratic Party to challenge Crowley's seat in 14 years. This is not an end. This is the beginning, she said during her primary victory speech. This is the beginning because the message that we sent to the world tonight is that it is not okay to put donors before your community. AOC went on to defeat her Republican opponent. In November, she became the youngest female ever elected to Congress. She was sworn in by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi on January 3rd, 2018. Shunned at times by her own party, she has not faded or strayed from her vision of diversity and inclusivity in all places of power where decisions are made. She continues in her role to fight for social justice for all. Thank you. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? That is a famous quote by Dr. Martin Luther King. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? I'd like to add another question with this quote, and that is, how can you contribute to a more just society? This is the question that we have all of our University 101 students reflect on the full semester. How can I contribute to a more just society? When I think of current modern day Martin Luther Kings, there are several people that come to mind. However, I am just going to focus on one person that has recently risen to the forefront of our nation. And that is a person by the name of Stacey Abrams. You might have heard of her. You might not have, but today 
I will share just a part of Stacey Abrams journey. She became the first African American woman to deliver a response to the State of the Union address. She also is a lawyer. She's an entrepreneur and a romance novelist. Stacey Abrams became a national democratic icon after losing a governor's race in 2018 by just 55,000 votes. Her race was a spotlight on voter suppression in Georgia. You see, in 2017, then Secretary of State Brian Kemp, current governor now in Georgia, ordered over half a million voter registrations to be canceled, saying that they did not live in their residence anymore. And I know that seems hard to believe that people are still experiencing this type of suppression, but I'd like to share a brief testimony of a 92-year-old woman. This 92-year-old woman from Atlanta, Georgia, went to the voting polls in which she had voted for the past 50 years and was turned away saying that she no longer lived in the area, that she was not registered to vote. She went away baffled because she still lived there. She didn't understand what had happened. Stacey Abrams was, was aware of this voter suppression before her run for governor and had co-founded in 2014 an organization called the New Georgia Project. It is a nonpartisan effort to register and civically engage Georgians. Regardless of her loss for the governor's race in 2018, Stacey Abrams knew that she, was, she still had work to do. There was work to be done. And after witnessing the gross mismanagement of the 2018 election by the Secretary of State's office, Abrams launched Fair Fight to ensure every American has a voice in our election system through programs such as Fair Fight 2020, an initiative to fund and train voter protection teams in 20 battleground states. Over the course of her career, Abrams has founded multiple organizations devoted to voting rights, training and hiring young people of color, and tackling social issues at both the state and national levels. In 2019, she launched Fair Count to ensure accuracy in the 2020 census and greater participation in civic engagement and the Southern Economic Advancement Project, a public policy initiative to broaden economic power and build equity in the South. She is credited for boosting Joe Biden's victory in Georgia in which this state last voted for, this state last voted for a Democratic president in 1992. I started with this quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Again, I live with you. How can you contribute to a more just society? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gloria. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Thank you, Davidson. Um, and I would elaborate a little bit that if those of you are paying attention in terms of the events, 
if you look at the list of executive actions that President Biden took on the first day, you will see reflected in those executive orders on the very first day of his presidency, the issues that were championed by these people that were just introduced to you. Not the least of which was the action with respect to climate change towards the Green New Deal that AOC has championed. And there are many more others. We just, we don't have time, but, but the importance there is that choices, actions can make a difference. Uh, and, but again, our goal today here is not retrospective, but rather to remind ourselves and to reorient and to gain perspective. And in doing so, we want to clear our minds and our eyes for the work that lies ahead. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was both a man for his time and at once a man out of his time. We must not romanticize as Davidson alluded to, and we must not forget that although he is honored in retrospect, he was not generally beloved by the American people at his time. Indeed, he was called by some, the, quote, the most hated man in America, unquote. His organizing, his writings, his speeches, and the sheer force of his personality was a radical challenge to the status quo. He balanced determined and strategic patience with what he called a, quote, fierce urgency, unquote. Both he and John Lewis insisted that negative peace would never suffice and fought for positive peace. That peace that comes from self-determination and the freedom of each person to claim his or her humanity, rather than to wait for someone else to afford that recognition when it seemed to them convenient. Dr. King did not fight only for racial justice and equality, though he battled furious, furiously for the proposition that denial of rights, dignity, and opportunity stood in the way of not only a just society, but stood in the way of progress towards prosperity. He, un he understood that economic inequality both stemmed from and also perpetuated the injustice of racism, but it had even broader implications as an obstacle to a just society. He argued strenuously that a person's labor has dignity and deserves respect rather than just exploitation. He argued and fought for a form of social justice that eliminated access barriers to social supports, to healthcare, and to employment opportunity for all, that none should be excluded from the resources of public institutions created for the benefit of the general populace. Martin Luther King argued for environmental justice in the face of targeted placement of waste dumps and toxic pollution sites near communities of color, and that the failure to address such irresponsible pollution threatened humans and ultimately the very planet that we live upon. And he argued perhaps most arduously for civic justice, the right to vote, the right to participate in democracy. He fought for a very simple but profound principle that each person in the nation should have as much right to have a say in the making of laws as that person has the burden of being subject to those laws. And it's also important that we note that his activism and his leadership was generative, that it cultivated that spark that I referred to before in others. His leadership inspired the activism of a host of others who went on to become civil rights leaders. Ralph Abernathy, Julian Bond, Jesse Jackson, Reverend James Lawson, John Lewis, Albert Raby in Chicago, 
and Mayor Andrew Young all stood with, marched, and were inspired to action by Dr. King. Uh, and so hopefully there's a message here that we too can be inspired and do something. As, as John Lewis said, say something, do something, because it can make a difference. What strikes me is, I hope that you've seen in the course of what we have presented from the Selma March to today, how many recurrent themes we have. Uh, you know, that old aphorism that those who do not learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. Uh, and we seem to be a little slow on the uptake. Uh, but we're, we're getting there. We're, we're, we're making some progress. And we stand on the cusp now of, of a new administration, which offers us some hope. But we cannot afford to assume that the transition of power will cure the ills of our society, or even be able to rectify and rebuild all of the damage done over the past few years. The struggle for justice and equality and human dignity to overcome systemic racism and injustice in this nation has never moved in a straight line forward. Whenever there have been steps forward, we inevitably have seen a step or two back. That's the nature that's the very nature of the struggle, of our struggle. It's not a momentary contest or a win-lose race. We have the burden of Sisyphus to continually strive and push. And it's an uphill battle, sometimes more so than others, to keep pushing for justice and equality and democracy. Yet we know that if we relent, the forces of greed, deceit, bigotry, arrogance, and injustice will surely roll back down upon us, crushing us in bone and in our souls. We have seen over the past months how unwillingly those who have held the reins of power are reluctant to let go. And let's hope that the inauguration yesterday will mark a new waypoint where the forces of justice, democracy, and humanity can once again gain solid footing and momentum for the continued push. The discouraging, the developments of the past few years should remind us that the causes that Dr. King advanced are important, but we should be invigorated not despairing, we can and must challenge ourselves to redouble our efforts to move forward for justice and democratic values. Dr. King taught us from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, quote, we must make the pledge that we shall march ahead. We cannot turn back. We will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and the righteousness like a mighty stream. So what I'd like to do now uh, is open up the floor to thoughts, reflections, reactions, questions. We spent a lot of time presenting to you and talking at you. Uh, we want to hear from you. What do you think? How would you respond to the question, what can, what must we do now? Paul, this is Maxine. Sure. May I speak? Certainly. You know, uh, several things just uh, resonated for me as we were, as I was hearing um, you all um, offer, you know, um, this presentation, but the, um, 
you know, the civility of our world, uh, it feels as though it's somewhat diminished. Um, but I go, uh, I move into um, what uh, Gloria mentioned about um, a just society and, and our role and responsibility as um, gatekeepers of education, I guess, you know, where students come to us. And, and um, so I think of social responsibility in that context um, and, you know, creating a better world, you know, as, uh, as um, you know, in the words of, of John Lewis, good trouble, you know, on my desktop, I have a, a sticky note that says good trouble, John Lewis. And so I'm reminded every day about, you know, my responsibility as, as an individual to society. Um, you know, I thought about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, you know, John Kennedy and, and the movement of that. But I also, um, you know, I'm always reminded as, um, you know, when I think of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and, you know, the work that he did um, and equality for all people, you know, I still see pockets in our society that we still, there's still work to be done. And, you know, I think of, um, you know, the right to vote, you know, um, when I think about that, I think of American Indian populations. Our American Indian people didn't have the right to vote until 1927, 28, I, I, you know, and, uh, you know, indigenous people. And, and um, you know, it, uh, there's still some, you know, whether it's intentional or not, invisibility among segments of our population. And we saw that during the elections. Um, and, um, you know, where uh, a segment of a population, indigenous people were um, considered the other, you know. And so I'm reminded, this is a good reminder for me um, to continue the work of, of um, advocacy, you know, uh, grounded in the Civil Rights Act. And so I appreciate, um, you know, always, every year, this is a reminder for all of us that uh, we carry this forward throughout our daily lives. So I thank you all for, for um, um, the contributions that you've made for this presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine. Um, uh, you know, very apt comments. And it's important for us to be aware too, in the 2020 election, there were uh, Native Americans who were denied the right of vote because claiming that their residence on the res did not constitute a valid address. So, and, and it boggles the mind that how someone who was here first could be classified as a non-citizen. That, uh, that one's beyond me. I, I just, I can't get there. Are there, are there other comments, please? I think um, Paul, I, just, I would Paul, like to I share. Just say something? Oh. One, one last comment. I just, okay. um, I, I just wanna, um, we have a visitor among us, um, a dear friend of mine who lives in Washington, D.C., and I asked him to join us today. And so he's uh, with us, Dr. Bill Moss. Um, you know, he knows what's happening over there, but I, I uh, extended an invitation for him to join us. He worked many years in tribal communities. And, and uh, so I just wanted to say from the Heritage family, we welcome you. Thank you, Maxine, and welcome, uh, Dr. Moss. Saul? Okay, um, so I am currently a sophomore at Heritage, and I'm working as a mentor for both the CAMP program and TFA. I didn't really plan on speaking or sharing anything, but with so many strong messages and activists, I felt that it was also important that we recognize the administration, professors, and even alumni of Heritage because many, if not all of these people work for a change that is sometimes overlooked, the change of equity in schools. Sometimes this also affects people of color. Equality is commonly associated with um, social issues, perhaps because more people know what it means. And so in a nutshell, it's a definition, it, as it sounds, the state of being equal. 
Equity, on the other hand, provides people with resources that fit their circumstances. I believe that Heritage University works very hard to do just that. And so with that, I want to thank those that are here and those that could not be. Thank you. Uh, I, I think Saul Neely uh, wanted to make a comment. He had to go teach. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, we do have day jobs, right? Uh, other comments, please? Welcome, anyone's welcome. Just your thoughts, reflections. Well, I'd just like to reflect on what Dr. Martin Luther King stood for. Um, and it's always good for us to come together um, as a university, bring the students together, uh, bring the community together to honor such a leader. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King stood for harmony, he stood for peace, and he stood for love. Um, I think about the song that was so famous um, back when he was doing the march, actually. We shall overcome someday. We'll walk hand in hand together, black and white together. Yes, we all shall overcome someday. And my uh, encouragement to all of us is to keep the dream alive, do what we can to make a difference um, and make sure we support social justice as well as diversity. Um, we're in an era right now where we need each other. And what are we doing to meet the needs of others? And whatever you're doing, make sure you're making a, an impact because people need us, they need help, they need, um, they just need us. And I, I worry about people not getting the support that they need. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. And we have to understand that these things are inter inextricably intertwined. We're facing the pandemic crisis and we know that the impact of that crisis hits more heavily on communities of color and yet it is a health crisis for everyone. And so unless we work together, unless we understand uh, that, it, that we face, that we're in this together and that we need to work together to get through uh, and to get on, to move on, to move forward, to get past this threshold. Other thoughts? But I can say something. All right, Joseph. Okay, so uh, I remember uh, Muhammad Ali's funeral and um, that funeral, you know, uh, drew, drew a lot of uh, people from all over the world and the oppressive regime in Turkey, uh, the statesmen came there as well so that they could use it as an acknowledgement to whatever they are doing. So what I'm saying is that whatever we do here in the United States has reverber reverberations, has, you know, uh, butterfly effects in other parts of the world. So the more we um, recognize diversity, the more we uh, speak up about minority rights, uh, the more impact it has on other parts of the world as well. So that was my two cents. Thank you, Yusuf. And I, and I think that's, that's very astute too, especially timely because the world, and I, I follow news feeds from all around the world, the world is watching. They saw the assault on the very core of our democracy, and they are watching and waiting to see what we do now. Uh, they see uh, that the, one of the most advanced nations in the world is struggling with uh, not only the health crisis, but an equitable response to it. And they are watching and waiting to see how we do. So, um, the rest of the world is uh, watching. Other thoughts? Hi, Paul. Can I say something? Uh, we have we have Gregory, and then I, I didn't see who's, who's going next. But go ahead, Gregory. Oh, I just again just wanted to thank each of you for stepping up and, and putting this together and, and really um, sharing some really great things today um, for us. And uh, I also, you know, just thinking um, with all the things that were 
changing in our in our society and culture, the way we interact, the way we communicate, uh, particularly with social media um, and how that's impacting not just our world, but I think particularly our young people. Um, I, I just really hope that there is uh, young young students who are able to really think of a way to articulately articulately um, develop strategies to make that space equally as equitable and to also hopefully change some of the, the, the negative downgrading behavior that is an unfortunate part of social media today. So I, I just wanted to encourage our, our students who are here to um, be a voice in that area for us. And uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Greg. And uh, we were going to try to feature, uh, but the, the time didn't allow the uh, performance of the Youth Poet, National Youth Poet Laureate, Amanda Gorman, uh, which uh, there's a lot to be said about her performance. But for me, what was, I think, most poignant is that she provides us a glimpse into the future. The idea that so much mental flexibility, such depth, so much passion, uh, and such um, spirit could be embodied in someone so young gives me at least hope for the future. And her performance showed us that the, the very job, and Greg could speak to this, the job of art is to force us to see the world in different ways. Uh, and she, through her art, uh, through her poetry, has given us different glimpses of different ways to see where we are and where we might go. And so we want to follow that up in the programming for February. Uh, but we also want to incorporate in that process more students in that process so that so that we can be led as well as lead. Other thoughts? We've sort of run out of our allotted time, but I do want to leave the, the opportunity here for people to just share thoughts if they have them. No, I'll be brief. Paul, I want to thank you for your commitment to this work and um, for this celebration um, in a time when it's uh, difficult, I think, in our society. One of the things that I really remember and have been studying more is the um, letter from Birmingham jail and the recognition of the biggest stumbling block that Dr. King speaks to is the white moderate more committed to uh, order than justice and justice for all. And that time to me has never really um, been more evident in this existing uh, time in, in, in my ever in my in my history. I, I never expected to see what we saw, um, the disruption of democracy intentional. Um, it just was not something I could fathom. It, it was, I struggled enough with a pandemic, um, but this almost makes the pandemic seem small in comparison and the fragility of, of democracy as it exists. And I really have taken to heart the importance of not being a bystander anymore. And, and um, just again, really that letter from Birmingham jail and particularly that line um, of that white moderate, it's not the white supremacists. We know what they seek. We know what they want. It's the white moderate being the greatest stumbling block that really is the, the frightening part um, uh, of that message um, that seems so true and evident today. Thanks, Mel. Uh, you know, it, it aligns with the quote about one of the greatest dangers is for good men to see evil and do nothing. Uh, it's, um, it is really you know, important. And, you know, maybe I seem a little bit hype, a little bit uh, over the top, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm only 70 years old and just getting started, right? I, I started school at the age of four when Brown versus the Board of Education was, was decided. And I'm, I'm just getting warmed up. So um, I encourage you and I'm going to ask for, reach out to and push and prod all of us to do what we can. 
Okay. So Mary, any closing thoughts? So we will follow up this particular program in February. We have other programs asking us to think about which what each one of us can do, but also to look deeply and carefully at our own hidden biases. And so my personal challenge is take a look at our own hidden biases and take a stand to open our hearts and minds to changing ourselves as we go shoulder to shoulder to change the injustice in our communities. So we'll see you at more programs. Thank you all. Positive peace be with you. Thank you, Paul. That was great. <laughs>